Welcome back to Drive Your Thoughts Podcast. I'm your host, Master Coach Carrie Marshall, and it's time to go after those goals. Yeah, whether ready or not, life's coming hard, no breaks, no stop. And if you put me on the spot, don't get it twisted. I never drop. If you feel a bit out of control and out the box, here's a way that you could drive your thoughts. Turn this podcast on, it's a lock. Carrie Marshall. Hey, what's up, everybody? I am so excited today to have one of my dear friends on the podcast. And honestly, it happened to be at the really a perfect timing because, Teresa, you're leaving soon. Yeah, I will be moving out of the country for about a year. Now, this is something that you're used to doing is moving out of the country. So we're going to get to all of that. But first, I want to do the official introduction because um, I, I just... I love being around passionate people Mm -hmm. and every time I get to be around you, it is incredible that passion. And so, um, everybody, this is my dear friend, Teresa Harding and Teresa is a global entrepreneur an investor, wall street journal, best-selling author, which I love philanthropist speaker and a world and life business strategist. Um, Teresa, you've built a business of over a billion dollars in sales. Um, and, Tell me some other things that you've been able to do. You've opened businesses in how many countries? 40 countries? Yeah, in building that business, one of the things that had to happen was we had to be, you know, get open in different markets around the world. And so of course we had a whole we had a whole corporation behind us taking care of a lot of the details. But before they could go in and take care of that, we would go in and we're boots on the ground, figuring out shipping, figuring out how to get the product there, all you know, all the dirty details, working with the people who were local, who were amazing, and kind of getting things going so that, you know, corporate people could come in and take over and and do their amazing thing that they do. And so it was really, really neat experience. I learned so much, made so many mistakes, and figured out how to do a lot of things. Well, and to be able, like you said, to be boots on the ground with the people in these countries is such an incredible experience. Yeah, it was so fun. And then, and then you and your husband have implemented scholarships to support people seeking further education to benefit their lives, donated to charities, um, had all of these charitable organizations, universities, everything. And then uh, it says, um, acted as the president of a local chapter f- to the largest women's organization in the world. So I know that coming from a place of lots of success, there also comes this space for you of lots of service that comes along with it. Because I know that every time you go into these countries, it's not just about, you know, getting the business there, but it's also about the service aspect as well. So tell us a little bit about your your latest thing that you're doing, because this is all service oriented, um, <laughs> where you're going, tell us yes. where you're going, and then what you're going to be up to. So we're actually leaving now to go on a mission for our church, and we are going to Armenia, Georgia. That's the area that we will be in and and helping serve in. We just found out recently that we will be actually living in Armenia to start with, and it borders on Ukraine, where a lot of difficult things are happening right now. Mm -hmm. So we're really excited to be able to go out and, and get to know the people, get to know the culture, figure out, find ways that we can help. And it's very structured. There, there's a structure in place already. So we'll be joining that structured situation where it's very organized. And so we'll be able to go in and start implementing some things that will help the people, finding out what their needs are, doing a lot of service, and, and sharing, sharing the gospel, sharing our belief about God and Jesus and, and what that can mean in their lives. I love that. That's so great. So you've done all of these different ventures where a lot of it is unknown, you know, opening businesses in different countries, you know, serving all of these things. How do you face or is there any fear when you go and do these new ventures that may or may not work out? Yeah, I think a lot of people, they look at me and they think that there's no fear because I'm a, I'm a very confident person. But there's absolutely fear. There's always fear. There can't be courage if there's no fear. If you have no fear, that's not courage. That's just, I'm just going to go do something. And I love the quote where they it says, um, I'm not braver than anyone else. Someone who's courageous is not braver than anyone else. They're just brave five minutes longer. And oh, so what happens that. is you have the fear. You just do it anyway. Mm-hmm. And so I think a lot of times people need to know this because people tend to look at someone who has already achieved something 
or they look at someone they admire, or they look at someone who's done something that they want to do, and they think, oh, they're different. No, they're not different. They just did it anyway. Mm -hmm. They felt the same feelings that you feel. They, they experience the same struggles that you have, but then they do it anyway. And it, it makes me think of this. One of the things I do in my trainings when I'm working with people um, in different areas of the world that we work in, and it's, it's very powerful. I would love for your listeners to think about this. I want you to think of the thing that you are the most proud of that you have ever done in your life. The most proud. It might be... Um, uh, paper that you wrote. It might be something that you did as a service project around the world. It might be that you endured in a tough situation that was really hard. It might be something you're doing right now that you're working toward or going through. And I want you to think about this, something, but think about whether it's a piece of it that you've already achieved, something that you have done that you are so proud of. And sometimes we don't want to pat ourselves on the back, but I want you to really, something you would pat yourself on the back. If, if someone who loves you was bragging about you, they would say, are you kidding? You, they just did this thing. And they had to go through this and this and this, and then they accomplished this thing. And it might be uh, some race that you won, won or even ran in or anything. And I want you to think about that. And there is not one amazing thing that you did through the entire process it was you kept doing the little things every day or almost every day, but all of what you went through is probably the hardest thing you've ever done. The h hardest um, moments that you've had, the most telling times about yourself where you really had to face who you are and change something so that you could go after that thing. And it's the same way for anyone. Tony Robbins, Mother Teresa, um, uh, Martin Luther King. I don't care who you're talking about. You look at all of those people, you could not l name one amazing thing that they've done. Not one. If you put it all together, yes, it's amazing. You couldn't say one action that they completed that was, whoa, that was so amazing. But if you take all the little pieces, they just did the little things and they didn't stop. Well, and what you mentioned is so important, which is the thing that you're most proud of isn't ever going to come without the courage to do something that probably you haven't done. Like you and I aren't sure. going to be super proud of like brushing our teeth this morning because it's just actions that we take. Right. Right. But in order to be proud of something, most of the time we're doing things that are out of our comfort zone you know, um, helping people write books and things. That's like usually the thing that they're most proud of, but it's because of the obstacles that they had to overcome that make it that much sweeter. Yes. And I love what you said. I, I love the example you used about brushing your teeth because it depends on where you are. I've been in places in the world where we're educating them on learning how dental hygiene. So for them being able to brush their teeth every day, it is, it, that's, that could be their thing. Mm -hmm. It depends on where you're starting. And I'm not talking about, oh, someone's starting at a higher level or a lower level. No, we all are working on something different. And so if you're working on your thing that sacrifices the old you to make the you that's going to be the better you, then that's all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned something that I think is really important, which is celebrating. Why do you think people have such a hard time celebrating themselves? Oh my goodness. I think partly because we're taught to be humble. We, you know, a lot of people, whether you are Christian or not, like people who are Christians are using, they're using the Christian thing. I want to be Christ-like. People who are not Christian, they're thinking, you know, I don't want to aggrandize myself. I want to be someone who is um, service oriented or, you know, most people are good people. They want to be a good person. We want to be recognized, but we don't want to act like that's the most important thing. But the truth is, we, we, we need to be celebrated. Every, the little things that we accomplish, the, the people we are, what we're doing in this world, it needs to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. And it's so important that we celebrate it in that space of, you know, seeing that it's the accomplishments. And when we celebrate that it can actually be an example to other people. Oh, for sure. So tell me a little bit about... How, how did you become such a go-getter? Have you always been this way? Oh, absolutely not. 
when I was, I'll, I'll give you a story from back when this is when I was in sixth grade, just so you get an idea of the type of personality that I was, because I was kind of, a, I was a whiner. I was a blamer. I, everything was always someone else's fault. And why didn't good things happen to me? And, and it took some work to get past that, but I'll give you this example. So I, I remember we would go out to recess cause I still got to have recess and I was really good at tetherball. They had tether balls out there and man alive. I beat, I would beat everybody. I was really good and I was super short. So I, I was under five feet tall until I was probably at end of my sophomore year. So I was really tiny. So I just knew how to play that game and I would beat everybody and people would stand in line around the circle and wait their turn to come in. And if they got beat too many times by me, they would go to the other tether ball so they could have a chance. And if I ever got out, everybody would cheer. Because they finally got Teresa out. Now, of course, I took that personally instead of realizing what it actually was. But I, I remember right, one recess right before the bell rang, somebody got me out. And I'd been winning the whole recess. I, they got me out and I was pouting. And we went in and sat at our desks. And I sat down. I put my head on my desk because I was so, woe is me. And you know, nobody likes me because of course that's why they cheered when I got out, which is obviously not the reason. And I remember this, there was a boy sitting in front of me and he was new and he was really cute. And so I remember he turned around and he was playing with my hair and trying to cheer me up and kind of, you know, poking at my hands and whatever. And I was liking the attention, but I just kept pouting. And he was like, what's the matter? What's the matter? And I was like, mm, you know, I wouldn't really say anything. And there was a boy in the row to the right of us. Look, I even remember which side of me he was on to the, to the right of us. And his name was Tony. And he was one of the most popular kids in the class, but he was, he was the nicest kid in the class. And if it hadn't been Tony, I probably, it probably wouldn't have mattered. But Tony said to this boy, he said, oh, don't worry about her. She does that all the time. And I remember thinking, oh, I have never done this before. But because it was Tony and I saw how he treated people, this is in sixth grade that I recognized this. Yeah. Some, I realized there was a problem. I wasn't ready to change yet. Several things had to happen. It wasn't until several years later that I, I changed that. But so that, that gives you an idea of what I was like. Mm -hmm. And so, no, I didn't have the confidence. But I, this is what, what happened was, I, I watched someone, I saw someone who wasn't that they had the confidence, but I remember watching them one day. It was actually my sister. And this is years later. We went to watch her at one of her events at high school and she was older than me. And I went and she walked in the gym and there were groups of kids everywhere. The ones that they called the, um, the gang bangers, the one that they called the, um, Oh, the goths, whatever, you know, all the different groups that you, that people would call them in those days in high school, whatever. And as she walked by, everyone freaked out to see Julene. And what I noticed was this, because I had been selfish. I, I was worried about me and what I could get out of things. But I noticed that the look in their eyes was they felt loved. They, it wasn't, oh, I'm excited. Julene's getting attention. It was, oh my gosh, look how she makes them feel. And every group, it didn't matter what group. And she was, would have been considered one of the popular kids. She didn't think of herself that way at all. But as she walked around, the, um, the Mexican group had nicknames for her. And they're like, they call her Beaner. We have part Mexican, and so we're all proud of that. But they would call her Beaner, and that was her Mexican nickname. And it didn't matter what group. All the groups, all the ones that either sometimes feel ostracized or feel included, it didn't matter, all of them. They, they loved on Julene. Julene, they were so excited to see her. But again, it wasn't that she seemed to be the loved one. It was, I could see in their eyes, how she had made them feel. And I, that's the first time in my life ever, ever that I remember thinking, I want to make people feel like that. Mm -hmm. I want to be the kind of person that does that. And that changed my life. It really did. Well, and now from our perspective, my perspective to be able to see that, that's one thing that your husband and you do so well. Um, you and Roger are so good at seeing people and really zoning in on them and loving them where they're at and really taking the time to be with them. Even though you are both, 
you know, all over the world doing all these <laughs> things. So that's really fun. Wow. Thank you for that. Thank yeah. You. So let's talk a little bit about being a woman, building a business while growing a family, because this is something you and I have talked about. Teresa and I, we got to go out to a jazz game with our husbands. (laughs) And it was really fun because we we did the first half, Teresa and I got to sit by each other. (laughs) And then the second half, the guys got to sit by each other. But that was so impactful for me talking about being a mom building a business because, you know, that that is a struggle, I think, for most women to know or am I spending too much time in the business? Am I, can I build a business, a successful business while raising a family? And I know that you've gone through this now yeah. that you're, uh, uh, you know, a mom, a grandma, how many grandkids do you have now? Eight, eight and grandkids. Eight. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about what that looked like for you as you were building a business while building a family as well. So for me, I was very adamant that I wanted to be the one that raised my children. I didn't want to take them to a daycare. I didn't want not not daycare, like, you know, going to school and practice working with other kids and having experiences with other kids. But I wanted to be a stay at home mom. That was really important to me. And so I did that for all of these years. And I I did little things on the side, like I, I started breeding dogs, didn't love it. But you know, always had a desire to do something. I had would do, you know, little sales projects. At one point I started a little preschool in my home because then I could be with my kids and have other kids come in and have them have experiences with other children. So that was really important to me. And I think the biggest myth, the in fact, I won't even call it a myth. It's a lie. It's a lie that people tell us in the business world is that you have, you just have to sacrifice your family for a little while, sacrifice your family for a period of time. That is a lie. You do not have to sacrifice your family. You do not have to give up being the one who is influencing your child. And obviously everyone is going to make their own choice. You decide what is the thing that is that you're called to do. But if you are feeling, and I've talked to a lot of women thousands of women. And so I know that a lot of women want to be the influence in their child's home, but they feel, they feel this calling to do something that is also meaningful because let's not pretend like you either be a stay at home mom or what you're doing is meaningful. I even was listening to Tony Robbins the other day. And he said, he said, what, why do you think the world is where it is? When we try, we try to pretend like being a mother isn't raising the next generation. They aren't raising these spirits of these, these um, unlimited beings. And he was kind of freaking out about it. And I thought, you go, Tony, you know, because we, we look at it and somehow we've gotten it flipped in our society, acting like being a stay at home mom is somehow less than it is. It's great. In fact, it's the greatest thing you can be. So how do you be that? and be present and be there and also answer this other call that you have, that you have something you're meant to contribute mm-hmm. because we all have something we're meant to contribute. And I was an, I'll just tell you that is one thing. Thanks to my mom that I had no question. I knew I wanted to be the influence in my children's life. So no matter what else I wanted to do, and I've been able to have all this crazy, awesome success. I'll tell you the hardest thing I've ever done is be a mom and be there for my kids and be the psychologist and be the, you know, the analytical and teach them the, teach them the skills and make sure that I'm meeting their needs and being tough love and, you know, all the things that you do. And so, boy, you got me on a soapbox. (laughs) I love it. Stop me anytime you want. No, this is perfect. And so the lie that you have to give that up or you have to sacrifice some of that is not true. And I'll say this, when I first started my business, my boys were still in young high school and kind of moving upward in high school. And this, this business opportunity came and I knew that it was something special that I needed to be involved in and that I wanted to be involved in. But what a lot of people do and what the world tells you is when you have that choice, you go, oh, I have to do either or. And that is absolutely not true. What happens is you can do both. And when you, dis- as soon as you decide, oh, I can't do both. I can't be a stay at home mom. Not saying that you have to be a stay at home mom, but since we're talking about this topic, I can't be a stay at home mom and do this other thing. What happens is your mind shuts off as mm-hmm. soon as you decide that. When 
you refuse to decide that, you, it doesn't matter if you don't see a way out. It doesn't matter if it, do, it seems impossible. If you refuse to accept that answer, then what happens is your brain, um, let me veer off for just a second and talk about your brain. Your brain is taking in millions of pieces of information every second, every second. So imagine what that's like. And when you have not made a decision about something, let's say that um, you haven't decided, I will be a stay-at-home mom. I will not sacrifice that, which is what I decided. And I have something else to contribute to. And I'm going to do that. And I will find a way. If you haven't decided that, all these pieces of information come in from everywhere, from books you read, from some things people say, from feelings you have, from thoughts, everything. And it just, a lot of it just goes out the back door because there's nowhere, it's not needed. There's nowhere for it to go. But once you make a solid decision about anything, but we're just, we just happen to be talking about this. Then what happens is as your brain brings in these millions of pieces of information, this is what your brain is doing without you even consciously thinking about it. It's going, does that help me figure this problem out? Does that fit? Does that help it work? Does that work? Does this, is this going to help me? Is this going to make it over and over millions of times a day? And it seems like magic when you figure it out. But it's because your brain, you have made a decision. People have no idea how powerful a real decision is. Well, and it helps you, like you said, that des decisiveness mm -hmm. is then what everything filters through. So if, like you mentioned, if I'm deciding that I am going to be a stay-at-home mom and have something, you know, work it out, then that's the filter that everything goes through. And I'm not saying oh, that one opportunity would then take me out of the home or this, it would be a no. It would just be a no from that. I'm like, oh, if it's going to take me away from my kids for that long, it's a no because it's going through that filter, which right. is important. And I think that that's the key is like being decisive helps you to be a yes or a no or figure it out or say, I am interested in this. Okay, but how are we going to make this run through that filter of being a stay-at-home mom? And yeah. I know the thing that, like you said, I think that when we were talking about it, just you and I, the thing that made so much sense to me is you said, you have time. And that I was like, oh, good. I don't have to have it all, you know, all of <laughs> it right it now. Today. <laughs> yeah. But when you said you have time, but what you don't have time with is your kids. That actually does have a, a, a place and you're like, and your kids are this age, which means that, you know, your oldest is going to be out this time. And you said, that's the time limit. The business, there's no time limit. Right. You can do that anytime. Yeah. And for me, what that looked like was, you know, my kids were in young high school. And so while they were at school during the day, I was doing my business, but I had decided whenever they're home, I am not going to be doing my business. And there were situations where I would be um, doing trainings in the evenings. And so I made sure that those trainings were on the evenings where my kids were in their youth church program. And my husband actually was one of their leaders at the time. So if I had been one of their leaders in that situation, then I would not have done it on those evenings. Mm -hmm. But there, there ended up being lots of times where I was able to do my business. And when, so my business grew and it, it became extremely successful, what most people would call extremely successful as far as numbers go. And it was going great. I, uh, there were a lot of times I felt like I was chomping at the bit because I knew what I could do if I could have more time. But I knew what my values were and I knew that my business or the time with my kids and the influence with my kids, I knew it was more important to me. And so this is the way I want you to gauge it. If you can gauge it like this, it will change everything for you. You gauge it by your values. You know what your values are. Don't, don't decide your values and revisit your values and change them because the situation changes. If your value, you know, if you feel like, you know what, I want to have integrity in business. I want to work only with people in business who have integrity. Then when an opportunity comes where there's there, someone who you're working with, you can tell they're, you know, they're fudging things a little bit. That's where you stop. You don't go, well, I want to have integrity and I'll go ahead and do this little partnership with them, but I won't do more. No, you already decided. Same with if you want to be a stay at home mom and have a business, you already know what you want to do with your kids. Did I want my, like if I had little kids, do I want them to have interactions with other little kids? Yeah, so I might set up little play dates or something like that where two or three times a week, 
there um, at different houses, sometimes it's my turn. Mm -hmm. And the times while they're gone, that's where I'm going to be doing my, my work. Not when it's my time with my kids or when they're napping or those kinds of things. But what happens is people will change their values. In the moment, they're thinking, well, oh, my business is starting to grow. And so, you know what? I, I, I can't do both. Now look what happens. Think about the mind thing already. You've shut off the whole opportunity for your mind to help you figure it out. Mm -hmm. And now what happens is you go, well, I'll get a nanny. I'll get, or, you know, I'll do something else. Not saying that it, getting a nanny is bad, but if what you, like it, for me, if I want to spend time with my kids and I'm thinking, I think it would be healthy for them to have time with another adult, but I only want that to be two hours two or three times a week, then don't fudge on that. Right. Your value is I want this situation with my children and my family. Don't back up on that. Yeah. And I think that's exactly where I was stuck is I could see that I had kind of backed up into the values where I was like, well, it's just this one time or it's yes. just. And so that's why when we were talking, I was like, and like you were, I was like, oh, this just feels so good to be able to say, like I've misaligned out of my values, yes. you know, so of course I'm spending more time at work or traveling more than I want to, because it was the one time that now turned into two times that now turned into the monthly that now I'm out of the home more than I want to be. And so that's what I loved how you talked about it was it was a misalignment of values where as soon as I aligned back, I was, I, it felt so much better. And then the decisions are easier. Yes. You're like, oh, of course, this is what I want to, dis, to want to choose. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I did it too. I would watch very carefully because it mattered so much to me. But every time I started pushing the envelope and realizing, nope, I'm starting to put business more important than what my value said I wanted. Mm -hmm. And so then I change it. Your values don't change. So if you're changing your values, we've got a problem. Yeah, there's that, that misalignment that exactly. instead of getting back onto that value system, we're kind of playing around with it because we've decided that there's something else that's better, but it it won't ever match up because there's a misalignment with the values. Yeah, yeah. So you've helped thousands and thousands of people build businesses. Um, you've helped thousands of companies actually, or uh, companies in general just kind of set up. So now you've kind of shifted from of course, you're still a business owner, but now you're doing strategy as well and helping people with coaching, strategy. What else do you help people do right now with businesses? So my passion, my big passion, not that my other business is, I, I'm so passionate about that, but because I've trained so many people all over the world, this is, this is let me, for, I'll tell you why I'm doing this new thing. It's so funny because I thought of it as new, but the more I'm involved in it, the more I realize, it's not that new. Yeah. You've been doing it for uh, I've been doing decades. It That's exactly what I've been doing. <laughs> yeah. 80% of the time that I spend working with people, even when I started doing, you know, I was doing, having high end business clients, high end, I would work with people and literally 80% of the time that I spend with them at least is spent on mindset, limiting beliefs. And these are, some of these people are already extremely successful and it is so amazing to me because, and, and I've had a new lesson in it. So I'll get to that, my new lesson in just a second. But so what I'm doing is that's why my, my title now is I'm a business life and mindset strategist because I don't just want to teach people what to do. I, I want to have a strategy. I want to have a plan. I have a, I have a business coach right now. I will never be without a coach ever, ever. If you don't have someone who is teaching you or guiding you, this podcast is a perfect example. Make sure that you have these things in your life. So my business coach, he is just pumping into us. He says, plan, analyze, adjust. No, plan, implement, analyze, adjust. Plan, implement, analyze, adjust. You have to be working towards something. And so it's really interesting because as I've shifted and I'm doing this quote new thing. The real reason is because I'm realizing because I spend 80% of my time, all these thousands of people all over the hundreds of thousands of people all over the world that I have trained. If I can get them to the point where they know who they are, they realize what they can do and I can help them understand how to obtain the skills they will explode. They are eagles just waiting to fly, but they think they're chickens. And I, I mean, no offense against chickens, 
Uh, we are in cancel culture after all. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, as I would work with people, and when the people that I got to work with more individually, if we'd have a retreat, by the time we're done with our three-day retreat, people are they're in tears. They are moved. I, I will, I'll see people back three months, six months, eight months, a year later, and what they have accomplished is unbelievable once they know, once they understand. And I thought, you know what? I, I want, I'm going to spend more of my time helping people get to that place because, you know, you had kind of mentioned, we were talking a little bit about vision and goals and people, a lot of people, some people will say, oh, well, vision is easy, but it's the goals that's hard. Vision is where you want to go. Goals is the work to get there. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the work part of it. And a lot of people will say, oh, the vision part is easy. It is not easy. I actually think that people get very vague about the vision. They don't. Uh, yeah. They, they, even people who think they have a vision. Yes. When we really get deep, they get emotional when they really realize what their vision is. Exactly. And that's yes. what I see is that people have maybe the surface level of a vision, mm -hmm. you know, oh, I want to go on a trip with my family. Okay. Why? Where are you going? What do you want to do? Why is that important to you? What do you think you're going to get on the back end of that? And most of the time people don't spend the time on that because of the emotion that is tied to it. Yeah, and it gets, it can be, it gets uncomfortable. We don't like mm -hmm. to be uncomfortable. And the reality is the minute you think I want to go on a trip in your mind, in your mind, in your heart, what's happening? I want family time. I want closeness. The, the dream that we have in our head of what, what vacation means or what that trip means as a family. What it's going to mean for you to be able to pay for it all, you know? Right. Like, uh, and, and how it's connected to your childhood. There's so much to go into it, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh -huh. But people just say the one thing and they're like, well, that's my vision. I'm like, it's so much more than that. Yeah. And my, my passion is that every person on this, on this earth was meant to contribute something. You are here to contribute something that only you can contribute the way you're going to contribute it. And I, I don't say that tongue in cheek. I, I mean it. I have seen it over and over. And so you have something you were meant to contribute. And a, the, a lot of people, it's hard for them to figure out, well, what, what is that? And what I would say to you is look at what are the things that you do in your spare time when nobody's watching, when you can do whatever you want. And I'm not talking Netflix, get over that part. I'm talking, what do you do when you're like, I finally have some time for me. This is what I'm going to spend my time doing. Look at your music collection. Look at your book collection. Look at the things that you have gathered in your life. And what, do, what does everyone else tell you that you're really good at? They say all the time, oh, you're such a good listener. Oh, you're such a good listener. And people will say to me, you can't make money listening. You want to bet? Tony Robbins? Okay, don't tell me you can't make a lot of money l listening. And um, coaches, that's, that's what they do. Obviously, they have things they can help guide you and grow you. But... I would say this, absolutely never, never give up figuring that thing out. And the most important thing to look at is what is the thing that comes so naturally to you that you do it and you don't even have to think about it. I have a friend who, um, she, her husband committed suicide and he had some mental challenges that led to that. And she felt like she, you know, what can I do? What can I do? She was a widow of suicide. She ended up and, and I told her, I said, you are an amazing listener. She was actually who I was thinking of. You're such an amazing listener. And she said, yeah, but you know, what would I do? And I didn't really guide her through the process of finding this. She was a friend that we just would talk about this. She is now a very well-paid coach who guess who she coaches widows of suicide. And she knows she, and she's getting better and better and better at what she does. Mm -hmm. So the thing that you do naturally that you don't even have to think about and that you just, you love doing when you're done, you feel fulfilled. You don't feel emptied. You feel fulfilled. And I think that that, you know, when we get to that point of really living out our, what we're here to do, that is when that magic happens where we start to feel fulfilled. We start to light up about it. But then on the other side of that, we can make money from it. And, Absolutely. And I think that that's where a lot of people say like, oh, but I'm just doing this or I'm just doing that. But it's that we don't open up to the possibility of what our lives can be if we're really living into that truth. 
And they think, well, I don't, I, I shouldn't get paid for that because I'm just, I'm helping people. And let me tell you something. I will use something from the Bible to show you that this is, this is how God laid it out. King Solomon was the richest person in the world. In fact, if he was here today, what he had then would have been worth, um, um, analysts have looked at this. He would have been worth about a trillion dollars, which in that day was unbelievable. I mean, that was just unheard of. Mm -hmm. And the queen of Sheba was one of the most well-known queens. And she, the, the kings and queens from all over the world would come to King Solomon and ask for his advice. And when the queen of Sheba came to King Solomon, she'd heard about him over and over. And she said, I've heard about you over and over and over. I can't even believe that it could be true, that you could be that wise and that you would be able to, you know, have so much wisdom the way everybody talks about. And she came in and she, she met with him and she brought him a billion dollars, the value of what would be a billion dollars to give him as a gift so that he would impart of his wisdom. He was getting paid to share his wisdom, not because oh, I'm so valuable and I should get paid for this, but because where your treasure is, is where your heart is. And we know that whether you're a religious person or not, it's true. Where your treasure is, there will your heart, your heart be also. And she came and she paid him a lot of money. And it was interesting because Solomon didn't just give her some information. It says he gave her all the information, everything he knew, everything he had, he was willing to give her. He didn't keep some back and say, oh, oh, she might, she might, you know, use it to sell to other people. He, he didn't say that. And P.S., the billion dollars she gave him doesn't even count all that. That was the gold. That doesn't even count all the camels and the animals and the jewels and all the other things that she brought and gave to him to pay him for his advice. And that's really such a testament of investing in where where you think that you need to be. Um, I have one of my friends on social media. He was just telling me, I really want to do this. And so I'm going to go and invest in that. And I was like, that's exactly it is investing where your heart is as well. Yes. Um, because I see a lot of people that will invest in the wrong thing. You know, it's that bright, shiny object yes. where they're like, oh, this and this and this. And I'm like, but how is that part of your your process? How is that part of your journey? Where is that value system in place so that you can actually invest in what's supposed to mean the most for you? I love that. And I love that you use the word invest because that's what the queen of Sheba was doing. That is what we need to do. And it was interesting when she was, when she was done getting advice from him and his wisdom, she said, what you have told me, your reputation isn't even half of what you have to give. So even though his reputation was so beyond anything that was out there. And what's interesting is when you start to create, when you start to share the thing that you have to give, the only thing that gets in the way is your, the fear, the self doubt, the, you know, those limiting beliefs get in the way and then it stops you. If you don't stop, if you just, you're afraid and you do it anyway, you feel stupid and you do it anyway, you make a mistake and then you do it anyway. I have seen it over and over. I promise you it will become successful. And I like what you said that sometimes people are doing the wrong thing because you make the goal and then that creates the step-by-step process. Mm-hmm. Okay. I got to get to that goal. But if you're doing all the wrong things, you're not <laughs> going to get the result there. that you're looking for. Yeah. And so I know a lot of people I'm sure who are listening are thinking, okay, but that's the problem. How do I know what the right things are? Mm-hmm. It's actually pretty simple. You find someone who is already successful at what you want to do. Not someone who is trying to be successful at what you want to do. Not someone who says they're good at what you want to do. Someone who has proven proof of concept. That means they've done it and it is proven to work over and over. And a lot of times people have one success and they start teaching everyone that that's the way to do it. And they have this big success to show that that's how that's what works. That is like it's like they threw spaghetti you know how the spaghetti test where if yeah. your spaghetti's done, you throw a piece of spaghetti against the wall and if it sticks, it's done. Right. That's what they're doing. They're throwing spaghetti against the wall. Oh, that one stuck. And then they start teaching everyone. So if that's the bright, shiny object you're yeah. talking about. Make sure it's a proven pattern of success and then do what they do. One of the things Tony Robbins teaches is there, if you want to become successful at something someone else does, Let's say you've never shot a gun before, ever, ever. You could hit the target 
if you will do three things and you do this with who you find the person who's successful at what you are wanting to be or do. And you do these three things. You, you use the body language they use. You mimic it exactly. Imagine you're trying to shoot a gun. Where is their foot? How are they standing? If I'm trying to be a speaker from the stage, I'm like, when do they shrug their shoulders? How do they, you know, how did they walk onto stage? Exactly. How That's they always what on? I watch. I'm like, what, how are they walking onto the right. stage? You watch their, their physical mm-hmm. mannerisms and you mimic it because there is an emotion that goes with every mannerism. And so if you're, the gun one is easy shooting a gun because you're watching every, how is their shoulder? Oh, mm-hmm. their shoulders a little bit higher. Their shoulders a little bit lower. So you, you mimic their physical body. Number two, you think the thoughts they think. How do you find out what they think? You ask them. Yeah. You ask them <laughs> and hello, don't tell me you can't find out now. If it's right. someone who's been successful, you'll find them on the internet right? and you can find out what they think. You think the things they think. And where you notice the discrepancy, oh, I don't think like that. Mm-hmm. You know, they say this, but I don't think, I, I can't do that. Then you've noticed a discrepancy. Now you know what you need to work on. And the third thing you do is you do what they do. You take the actions that they take. So if I look at someone who's successful in my arena of a business life and mindset strategist, if I see someone who's running around like a chicken with their head cut off, then that's not the person I'm going to want to mimic. I want to find somebody who has balanced life, or I might find someone who is really good at helping people with what they want to do. Let's I'll, I'll I'll even use this as an example. Let's say that I want to be able to influence people like Tony Robbins does or Oprah Winfrey. Um, Oprah Winfrey appears to have a different type of lifestyle than Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins seems to be busy. He's hyped to do events all, you know, pretty often. What if I don't want to do that lifestyle? I might want to. But if that's not what I want, then I can take the part that he's successful at that I do want to mimic and mimic that and find someone else who is very successful, very, quote, busy or could be very busy. And maybe I don't want to be that busy and I can watch what they do. Now, you can't take someone who isn't very busy and hasn't accomplished anything and sits around watching TV and mimic that because they're not very busy and I don't want to be very busy. Right. You have to you have to. Pick the people who are successful at what you're wanting to do. Because with that same thing I told you about the, you can be a stay-at-home mom and a business owner. You don't have to sacrifice being the stay-at-home mom and you don't have to sacrifice having a business. It's the same thing with, with your business. Now I don't have kids at home. I don't have to, I, I, the, the success that I am planning is crazy outrageous but that's what I do. That's me. I have these plans, but I will not have the lifestyle that most people associate with that type of success. I won't. And so I know that I can have both. I refuse to get up, give up on that Mm -hmm. concept. And I know that I will figure it out. And I am as I go. And I think that that's the most inspiring thing from the outside looking in is watching how you intentionally, you and Roger intentionally decide the lifestyle that you want. And then you go and figure out, you don't just say like, oh, this is what success looks like. Cause that's what it looks like for everyone else. You are so intentional about that, where you say, this is what we want to create. That's one thing that I love is that everything that you, 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 go out and do, there's intentionality behind it. What do we want it to look like? What do we want it to feel like? What are the, what are the experiences that we want to create and that it's not ever going to be tied to, well, so-and-so said it's supposed to look like this. Yeah. And I have the intention and then I mess up and then I have the intention again and then I do it wrong. And then I have the intention again. I shouldn't say do it wrong. I do it a way that is not the direction I wanted to go. And then it happens over and over and over again. And I just have to say that Number one, this new venture, I totally thought, oh my goodness, I've had all these experiences. I'm very confident. I know how to run business. I know how to teach people how to build business. I I know what I'm doing. I have so much to learn, no question, but I feel like I've had so much experience. I've had a lot of success. And yet, and so I thought, I'm just going to take it into this new thing that I want to be helping people with. And I am going to just go. And now I know I have these experiences. I know what to do. It has been so scary. Like, I can't even believe. I'm like, Teresa, you've been through this. I thought you had been figured this out. But you know what? Every time you start something new, it's a new thing. It's going to be scary. And it's, it, it's not easy. And I, you know what? Would I want to do it if it was easy? 
If I wasn't yeah. learning anything, it wouldn't be growing me. Yes, exactly. And that's, I think, the whole thing with all of this is that we're all on these different journeys, learning different things, and knowing that wherever you're at is perfect. But I do think that that is where a lot of people get it wrong about successful people. They think that successful people don't need to do things that are scary. <laughs> and it's so not true. Sometimes it's so not I true. Myself, right. I'm not scared. Right. But really, I am. Yeah. Because like you said, in order to grow, we have to do things that we've never done before. And even starting a new business, even though you've built all these successful businesses, it's like, it's new. It's something new that you're doing. So, and I, I have the whole, um, what do they call it? The imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Like, who do I think I am? Mm -hmm. I'm not Tony Robbins. I'm not Oprah, you know, but you know what? I know I have something to share and I'm not going to let those voices stop me. And can I say one last thing about failure? Because I think people do not understand failure. They think failure means lack of success. And if you look up the definition, sometimes that is the definition you'll find. But there are also definitions. And this is the real definition of failure is I didn't get the result I was looking for. And the, the beauty, I wish people understood failure. Now I understand failure and I have a huge advantage over people who don't because failure is simply uh, uh, the life giving you an opportunity to take a new direction yeah. and realize, oops, that wasn't the right way. And I'll just tell you this. It's like um, Edison with the light bulb. He says, you know how everybody's heard the quote, the light bulb wasn't, uh, um, it wasn't, what you, how does he say it? Like Great. Thousands of ways that I failed. It was just thousands of ways that it, it wasn't right or something. Yeah. Like he that. said it wasn't 999 failures yeah. and one success. The light bulb was a process that took a thousand steps. Yes. And so what you don't realize is failure and success, those are pointing in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And there are, uh, like there, if you were to look at, this is what I'm trying to achieve. There might be 500 or a thousand different things that aren't going to work. And your job is to go figure out which ones those are. And the beauty of a failure is that as soon as you have one that we call, quote, failure, that means you've just eliminated one. Yeah, I so always, now you know that one. Exactly. I always say failure is feedback. And yes. if we can just continue to realize that, that the failure is just feedback coming in, we just flip how we think about it and it just becomes part of the process. Yes. And now you know another thing that doesn't work. And guess what? Your 50th failure in a row all that tells me is you are getting closer. You are getting closer and you will get it. Yes, absolutely. This has been so much fun. I'm so excited for this new chapter of your life, going to Armenia too. and Georgia. That's yes. going to be so incredible. Where can people find you? Where can people come and get more of the goodness of Teresa? <laughs> right now, the best place, because we're re kind of revamping things and um, my business coach I'm working with, we're going to be kind of finalizing things over the next couple of months. Awesome. So go subscribe to my YouTube channel right now. We're not posting, but if you're serious and you would like to kind of see what we're doing and be involved, you are going to start getting the information that we'll be putting out. It will be about two couple months from now and we'll start putting that out. So subscribe it, to my, ter it's Teresa, Teresa Harding, Harding. T E R E S A H A R D I N G Teresa Harding. And You'll subscribe to that and just be patient. Awesome. Give us a little bit of time. Well, I just want to tell everybody that's listening. Um, Teresa has been such an inspiration in my life. And I really want to encourage you, if you are serious about your goals, your visions, to definitely subscribe because uh, just being in the room, in the area with this woman will definitely light up your life and bring you so much uh, value. So thanks so much for making the time. Thank you, Carrie. And I just have to say, this is why our friendship is growing because I feel the same way. When I'm with you, I'm inspired. And those are the people I choose to surround myself with. I love it. Well, we're so excited and we'll catch everybody next time. See Thank ya. you so much. Thanks for listening to this podcast episode. If you're ready to get in the driver's seat of your own life, you can come and follow me at Drive Your Thoughts Coaching on Instagram or come and see more ways to work with me at driveyourthoughts.com. Yeah, whether ready or not, life's coming hard, no breaks, no stop. And if you put me on the spot, don't get it twisted, I never drop. If you feel a bit out of control and out the box, here's a way that you can drive your thoughts. Turn this podcast on, it's a lock. Kerry Marshall on the clock.